Good morning. My name is Timothy Walker. I'm a maritime security researcher here at the Institute of Security Studies in Pretoria in South Africa. And today we're going to be looking at maritime trade as Africa's lifeblood, which we're doing today on World Maritime Day, which is a floating date. It's something which occurs throughout the last week of September. Today we're going to be talking about some of the pertinent issues affecting Africa and the globe in terms of its ocean and maritime security, development and governance. So a very important time as well because it goes against a backdrop of some very important meetings and discussions which have been occurring at the United Nations and other organisations which will really have an impact on the future in terms of the ocean health and uh, the potential for sustainable development in the future. I'd just like to go into a bit of detail first about what is World Maritime Day and why is it so important. World Maritime Day, as I say, occurs towards the end of September. And this year is the 70th anniversary, or the 70th birthday, you could say, of the foundation of the International Maritime Organization. And that's the organization which annually organizes and hosts World Maritime Day. It organizes the day around pertinent themes. For instance, in 2011, it was piracy. Uh, this year, as I say, it's a time for a, almost a critical reflection upon the role that the IMO and others have played in the creation of safe and secure shipping and how important shipping is in terms of our food security, our imports and exports, our maritime security, and almost everything else you could think of. It has a maritime element to it. Next year, interestingly, and finally as well, is the uh, empowering women in the maritime community. And that's, uh, like I say, a very important uh, consideration for South Africa, which is going to be hosting a World Maritime Day parallel event uh, in 2020, and hopefully it will build on that kind of th um, uh, theme and the discussions there. That hasn't been discussed yet in terms of what it will be, but as I say, uh, something we'll return to towards the end. African agency in this regard is going to be very important. Um, I'd like to just, when I start a presentation, I like to always, especially when I'm in Pretoria, just remark on the fact that here we are discussing a maritime issue in a quite an inland city, one of the most inland you could reach. I like to joke of it as the great port city of Pretoria. And when you think about it, we might see, for instance, fish and chip shops, we might see uh, companies offering scuba diving expeditions, and people might have boats, and there's a general kind of maritime uh, awareness. But actually, if you think about it, we are incredibly dependent upon the maritime world. A lot of what we wear, what we use, what we'd like to import or buy, and what we'd like to sell overseas is carried through ports and through shipping. Therefore, even no matter how far inland we get, we are going to have be very dependent upon the role of maritime shipping. And that is why the IMO is so important. It creates the rules and regulations which have governed shipping over the last 70 years, but also builds upon centuries of laws and regulations and customary laws, which have created that kind of regime, which we are, as I say, dependent upon. Cities inland like this could not get as big or as expansive as they could be without that kind of connection with the sea. That's why we call it the lifeblood. Because remember, African countries, there are many coastal ones, 38 out of 55, uh, which leaves 17 inland countries. But those inland countries as well have various problems in terms of infrastructure, in terms of getting their maritime goods uh, imported and exported. That's why they also need to pay or have greater interest in the maritime domain. Interestingly, in 2015, Zambia joined the IMO. And there's an interesting recent example as well of a country, Ethiopia, wanting to recreate a naval branch of its armed forces. Until uh, the war with Eritrea, uh, Ethiopia was a coastal state, um, but it has a lot of ships flying its flag at sea. Now that's just a little paradox I'd also like to include there, is that you often have a lot of countries like South Africa, which have almost no ships flying its flag at sea. No ships pay to obey its laws and regulations. But other countries, and a very interesting example here being Mongolia, has over 60 ships, which has over 60 ships flying its flag at sea, carries a lot more traffic. And yet South Africa, if you'd look at it in terms of uh, its, its uh, geographical location, in terms of its infrastructure, which supports a lot of inland economies as well, is a maritime country. It has a huge amount of import dependency to such an extent that it's often commonly described as an island economy. If the seas would not be able to be uh, safe passages for shipping, then where would we get our imports from? Where would we be able to export our stuff from as well? That's why I think it's very important to look at it from this kind of angle as well. Not just to celebrate the kind of rules and regulations being created, but to try and look at it a little differently. What kind of impact 
do, does the maritime have on Africa and African countries? And what kind of role can Africa play in the future? And we'll get back to that towards the end of the presentation. Another thing which is very important to consider is that we also have an impact upon the seas now. Now, a very a good landmark broadcast recently of uh, Blue Planet 2, narrated by Sir David Attenborough, I think has really had a massive impact on our awareness and our interest in the oceans, at the uh, right from, uh, from the lowest to the highest levels as well. And that's great because one of the clear things in the final episode was the sheer amount of plastics being put into the oceans at the moment and the amount of pollution which flows from land into the sea. Now, the sea is divided up, or the oceans are divided up in terms of the uh, sovereignty and authority into various zones. There are 12 nautical miles off our shore is what we call the territorial waters. Now that is an area which uh, you would treat effectively as if it was the land. Uh, national law applies and, uh, and that coastal state must uh, or should uh, enforce the law over that area. Shipping coming in and out has a, uh, obviously have its rights and responsibilities too. Beyond that, you have the exclusive economic zone, which is 200 nautical miles. And a nautical mile is a, that would be roughly about, I think, 380 kilometers. So quite a vast distance away from the shore. And this is only a very recent development in the grand scheme of things, if you consider maritime history. Um, over the last sort of 20, 30 years, states have suddenly uh, taken an interest in the resources which lie beyond uh, the territorial waters. And beyond that, you have what's called the area beyond national jurisdiction, or often commonly called the high seas. And that's where we're now looking at a lot of progress because plastic will collect there. Ships will traverse this area. And the only authority, as it were, apart from treaties such as the Convention of the Law of the Sea, which govern behavior, are the coast, uh, the, excuse me, the flag states laws. And that is where you have a, what effectively what you could describe an anarchic situation. There is no higher authority. There is no liability as well then in that regard, because often the plastics which flow from uh, um, or are dumped at sea will collect in the mid-ocean where there is no sovereignty, where there is no sovereign power. The, the United Nations over the last two weeks, ending, uh, ending recently, has been a, a very interesting and, and very timely negotiation about creating a new treaty which will um, afford better protection for marine biodiversity and will better govern the exploitation because while we're very keen on conservation, we need to be very keen on conservation of, uh, of, and protection of, um, of vulnerable species and areas. Unfortunately, I use unfortunately in the term of the word I'm going to use now, which is exploitation. Exploitation is relatively inevitable. We have now the technology, there is increasing demand there is uh, an interest in exploiting or developing maritime resources. We often like to turn these blue economies or ocean economies, and with the increasing turn towards the sea, which you can see uh, regarding interest in seabed mining, in the interest in fishing and, uh, and, and the remaining fish resources, is that these resources are going to become under even more stress and more strain and governing those or trying to agree on common ways of governing them effectively and sustainably is a major global uh, initiative and responsibility. And that's why what's happened at the UN is really interesting, but it's only the first of the four parts of a meeting which will create this treaty in the end. Now, whether the treaty can be enforced and how strong it will be are other questions. The fact that we've started the process is great. That's why it's also important to look at what role African countries are going to play within that, not just as active agents, but also in terms of what kind of impacts will they be suffering. Now, a key uh, way of looking at the importance of the maritime world, especially in terms of Africa, I think, is what will we be doing in terms of job security and food security if we don't do something now? We have fishing fleets from all over the world, heavily subsidized, very sophisticated, who can go across the high seas and these areas where, there, like I say, there is no authority, but also they have the ability to enter economic zones and territorial waters of particularly African states because they lack the capability to resist or prevent, and sometimes strip the resources bare. Now, this is something which is going to be a big problem in 10, 20, 30 years' time. It's already a problem now. It's going to only going to get worse, though, because we will have increased populations in the future. We'll have climate change rendering inland areas inhospitable or um, unable to support agriculture. And you also have conflicts inland as well. 
Now that, that's a very fundamental turning point, or um, a key point or fulcrum for the debate, because we operate under what you might call conditions of sea blindness. It's a very popular term in South Africa, just used to describe just how the lack of awareness we have of how crucial the maritime domain is and the importance of it. We like to get interested in the available resources or benefits, but the liabilities and costs and the responsibilities are a lot harder to actually pin down and pinpoint. That's why, as I say, global action at the highest level is very necessary. And it's days like World Maritime Day as well, which can serve as that kind of point at which to look back at what we've achieved and also to look forward to. And that's why it's very important, as I say, that South Africa will be playing a more proactive role in the future too. Um, part of the protection measures which are in, 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 in envisioned are the creation of what you might call protected areas at sea. Now, that leads on to a very crucial kind of problem as well. How would you enforce these kind of measures? Um, the UK has recently announced to a lot of fanfare that it would aim to uh, protect 30% of its uh, areas at sea. Um, and South Africa has similar plans under Operation Pakisa, one of its initiatives to drive job development and, and economic growth, which would create marine protected areas as a kind of a, a safety zone. Um, I'm not describing it as well as I could, but it's well worth looking into marine protected areas because they will play a crucial role in sort of keeping the biodiversity of the seas going, not allowing catches and fishing in certain areas. That's why the treaty uh, at the United Nations is looking at creating these areas where there have been none before, where no state can actually claim or enforce sovereignty. Because it's at the high seas where we are now looking at, like I say, some of the greatest harm being carried out in terms of global warming and, uh, and climate change and plastic pollution. But also it's one of the areas where resources are, you might say, held in trust. There's a, a very common popular uh, almost principle to the way that oceans have been governed until now, which is that resources located there are what you might say is the common heritage of mankind. That means that we are um, similar in it, you could compare it to Antarctica, where there is a lot of claims, but there's a kind of a consensus that we won't pursue those claims so long as nobody else does. And that's been often the case with the high seas as well, that only a few states or companies can actually extract or develop those resources because it would be unfeasible because it would be very controversial, because um, these resources would only be accessible to a few, even though they might be closer to Africa, for instance, that there's been a holding off, a, uh, a, an interest in not developing them, um, even though well, throughout this time we've had increases or advancements in technology, uh, not necessarily in rules and regulations and sensibilities, though, which would accompany that. That's now changing. As I say, it's almost inevitable that we are now turning to these uh, areas. We have, as I say, better technology. There's more demand. There'll be more people. And the world, you could look at it in a way, has shrunk. Shipping crisscrosses and traverses these areas regularly. Ships are increasing in size, but also in numbers as well. Um, so there is greater human activity in what was previously uh, deserted areas, devoid of, uh, of people. Um, we are perhaps looking at then the beginnings of a new kind of a collaboration because criminal activity in this area, if it's illegal fishing, or if it's traversing this area towards another destination, is a transnational problem. It's a common problem. If the problem is common, therefore the solution would also be common, especially in a context where African countries lack navies and lack, lack the resources uh, to effectively mount a a, a unilateral or a, a state-driven approach. Because these vessels, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, can traverse areas with relative ease, territorial waters to exclusive economic zones. And this is the case with piracy as well, where there's, there's almost no barriers to the movement of, uh, of pirates. In the same way that there have been the, uh, no erection of barriers to the free movement of shipping, which has been a key principle of, of the oceans. So we're trying to now balance out, or we've reached this tipping point, where how can we as who is the responsible actor? Is it states? Is it companies? Where is the responsible, well, the best sort of forum to deal with these things? The states often are unable, or unfortunately, as I mentioned with sea blindness, not interested in pursuing these matters uh, to the fullest or most um, uh, optimum extent. Therefore, it's about increasing collaboration between uh, neighbors, between uh, trading partners, but all around the world. And, and that's why 
the maritime domain is such an, uh, like I say, a key and fascinating study area, but is also as well a potential for the future because the maritime domain, the oceans and seas link us all. As I mentioned at the beginning, we trade, we import, we export with partners all around the world. The maritime domain, you can set sail from one port and almost effectively reach anywhere on, on earth, barring a lot of the inland countries. But then if you have good infrastructure, you can easily link to those inland areas like Pretoria. Therefore, if we're going to look at a kind of a collaborative approach, we need to be looking at ways of not just governing the future or creating better governance models, but ways of enforcing it too. Because we've had a real shift, and I'd like to leave on this point here, a real shift between accepting the freedoms. There was a consensus that uh, you would allow the seas to be free of uh, claims, free of, uh, and allow the freedom of movement. But with the idea of maritime security nowadays increasingly taking a more proactive or positive approach where you want to enforce laws, you want to prevent crimes, that requires capabilities, that requires naval assets or coast guard assets, which very few have. And the answers which are being pursued are not necessarily to look at privatized solutions, even though those are very evident throughout the African maritime domain, but to start getting states to explore their options in terms of neighbor, uh, neighborly treaties or bilateral treaties, right up, to, for instance, to the African Union with its maritime strategies. An African agency there is very important. There's a, a, a history which has not been properly told still of the role African countries have played in creating maritime rules and regulations and regimes. What is very apparent from the history is that Africa has often been the victim or has suffered 500 years of dependency and conquest, which has been borne by the seas. And only until very recently have states been, African states been able to take a more proactive role in what is their maritime domains. Until recently, um, many uh, in the kind of post-colonial kind of uh, way of looking things, navies from Britain, from France, from the United States, in terms of the Cold War as well, were doing a lot of the patrols and uh, presence at sea. Now you have this increased interest, this lack of capability, but this kind of responsibility and drive to do something but we don't have the resources just yet. That's why it's a very important kind of metaphor to look at the maritime as, as the lifeblood, and also to recognize and celebrate the role that African countries can and will be playing in the future. Countries like Egypt and Algeria, the United Nations recently, and also, as I say, with South Africa, which is expected to play a very prominent role in World Maritime Day in the future.